that's one thing that I learned through that process is it's okay to say no. It's okay to take a step back and qualify your deals very, very selectively, especially in the first two years as a startup. And if you're honest and tell your prospect why you're saying no, they would actually appreciate and respect you as a founder for that. And we saw all of them eventually become customers. So it was it was eventually a win-win, you know, for everyone. Welcome to the Business Developer Podcast with Sujay, a source of inspiration for business developers. By listening to this podcast, you may gain some ideas, inspirations, or food for thought towards your own journey of developing your business successfully, now or in the near future. Thanks to each one of you who listened to the previous episode with Nicholas Aaron, wherein we learned that sales and staying relevant are the top challenge areas in developing a successful consulting business. In this episode, we shall learn about developing a technology business by listening to the experiences that Reisha Shroff has gained throughout her journey till now. This episode shall be the first one of my discussion with Reisha. I shall continue my discussion with Reisha again in the next episode of the Business Developer Podcast. So please join me in welcoming our guest, Reisha Shroff. Hello, Reisha. Welcome to the Business Developer Podcast. Thanks a lot for taking out time today. Thank you so much for having me, Sujay. That's great, Resha. Thanks a lot for coming in here. To give you a little bit brief about this podcast, Resha, it is a business developer podcast to serve as a source of inspiration for all the business developers out there in the field, working on their business, developing their business to get some ideas or inspirations or food for thought from experienced guests who come to the podcast like you by listening to you. So, Reisha, to get started, if you don't mind, if you can share a little bit about yourself, your background uh, for our listeners to learn about you. Absolutely, Sujay. I think you're doing a great service, if I may use that word, in, you know, coming up with this idea. I commend you for that. For the listeners, uh, I'm Reisha Shroff. Uh, Sujay and I have known each other through our past, you know, business development and sales stints. But for everyone who don't know me, I'm an engineer by qualification, spent over 15 years in sales, marketing, account management, business development roles. And today I run my own company for the last three and a half years. It's called Lynx Automation. It's an IoT platform. And today we are about 25 people on the team today. So it's been a great journey for me to compare and contrast working as a sales account manager for other tech companies and then starting my own tech company. And I'm very excited to share that learnings with, you know, with your audience today, Sujay. Yeah, that's great, uh, Resha. And that's one of the reasons I looked <laughs> called out for you to come here. And thanks a lot to support me in this initiative of helping the other business developers. So you have an interesting journey. And as you said, you and I have worked together in the past and we have worked in uh, services companies, right? Yeah. And helping our customers to develop their products. And you are now, as a product company, you have kind of taken a hat of your erstwhile customers, if I can say, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you see this transition from a services world to doing a product of your own? Yeah. How has that happened? And Maybe also if you can talk about your motivations and driving factor as to why did you even started Lynx as a company? Absolutely, Sujay. So while I was also working with, you know, the tech services companies, I was investing in my own real estate. And this was back in Chicago. I live in Sacramento, California now. But we have our own properties that we own and manage. Mm -hmm. And we've hosted over a thousand or more guests in the last 12 years, you know, through short-term rentals, corporate housing, service apartments. So 
you know, the idea for Lynx came from our own experience and struggles being operators, owners, and managers of short-term rentals. Mm. And we saw a serious gap in lack of technology that is available to this, you know, vertical. There is property management software and then, you know, there are the large platforms like Airbnb, Verbo, and Booking.com. But when you look at operations, you look at competing with a hotel in terms of guest services and amenities, there's really nothing out there. And that was the inspiration for Lynx, where I thought combining my engineering experience, you know, tech background with my experience as a rental operator, and then kind of building a product that is going to exactly solve that problem or gaps in operations management, Mm -hmm. checking in a guest, you know, managing your field workforce, housekeepers, inspectors, maintenance. I was always on the road or at an airport, you know, so that was the inspiration why I began the journey with Lynx. So you actually were a customer profile of Lynx itself or a user of potential for Lynx, right? Absolutely. Isn't that the best way to kind of find a problem in your own life and then kind of build something that, you know, that addresses that? Yeah, truly amazing. Yeah, yeah that's that's a really good position to be into if you can find that problem and take in that jump to solve that yourself. But in that point of time, if I can just think here loud, even in that position, you could have maybe try to venture out and try to see what services like Lynx you could buy rather than setting up a company like Lynx. Was that a search that you did? Absolutely, Sujay. I'm not someone who, you know, ventures into business or anything without thorough due diligence. So we did extensive competitive analysis. We found products that would compete with Lynx, you know, in the beginning year, if you will. And we evaluated as to why we wouldn't use that product or what does that product lack? Right. Because I don't want to develop something, even as a rental manager, anything that is already out there. Right. So we found that there are lots of off-the-shelf IoT products from smart locks, thermostats like Nest, um, lights and smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors, all of these which are a must-have for compliance Mm -hmm. in a vacation rental. But... To manage all of these devices when you have 20 or 40 or 100 properties under management and the number of devices you're managing becomes 500 or 5,000, we saw serious gap and the competitors that were there were saying, you know what, I have this one smart lock or I have this one light and that's all you can automate with or manage through my platform. And we had everything in our portfolio from class A to class C. We had single family homes. We had entire multifamily, small low rise operations. There wasn't just one thing that would fit all our doors. So I was like, this is a ridiculous solution of forcing me to use these exact five products across every single property, every single region. And that's where we took that approach of hardware agnostic software platform. And today we integrate with over 300 different smart devices, which clearly is, you know, 30 to 50 times more than our closest competitor. That's amazing. I think you then did the study, understood the need, found the potential, and then you saw there was nothing in the market. And as you said, it is very segregated, right? Piecemeal approach by each of the vendors or type of products, right? And not a platform which can serve all those needs and make lives better for the guests, for the property owners. So if I imagine then that is really good that you did that. But then if how about taking the step? How about rubber hitting the road from moving from someone And I believe it might be a little bit easier. You were anyways doing the property business, but still venturing out, Mm. setting up a technology company. Yeah. How was that experience, Risa, for you? Coming from a services background, it's business development to move into a technology product company. Yeah, that's a great question, Sujay. So there is one thing I will add for your listeners' benefit is even though this was a problem we understood very well as rental managers. Mm -hmm. We did not presume that our challenges were everyone else's challenges. So we did extensive 
interviews, surveys, reached out to other managers we knew, went to industry conferences and just spoke to people and said, would you give us, you know, 15 minutes during lunch or, you know, evening cocktails to just talk to you about specific problems. We never told them about the idea. Right. We wanted to understand is our problem everybody else's problem because I don't want only one customer, which is myself. <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> so, um, so all of that did go in and that was what, you know, became the voice of customer. What are the top five concerns that we heard over a hundred different property managers, mm -hmm. which were worth solving? What are they ready to pay for? This is a feature they're ready to pay for but not that one. That one they want for free. Right. You know, so I'm going to deprioritize that pro feature, if you may. And that's how we came up with what we call as our MVP, minimum viable product, where it was very basic, you know, kind of imitating one lock, one property management software for integration. So kind of picking, you know, the top yeah. with everything. And then we went out and found five customers that would find that solution beneficial. And based on those five customers, we started shaping. We already knew our vision that we need to be completely hardware agnostic. So we started integrating, you know, more devices. But the first five customers help us shape the product to say these are the things that are lacking in terms of UI or visibility mm. or functionality or today this is how my ROI is spread over number of check-ins but if the software could do you know x y and z then we could spread it over part operations part check-in part guest experience and find that ROI even faster so you know, those were the inputs. So we're constantly talking to our first 10 customers and continuously developing the product. And then the journey from 10 to 100 was obviously very different because we're constantly thinking about scale and processes and tools. It was no longer a hustle. It was a business. Mm. <laughs> so that's where that sincerity of productization came in after the first 10 customers yeah and that's true and those initial anchor customers are very important for a business to shape it up it's good to have those and it's very critical to have those but have you experienced where these customers could be pulling you in a direction where it becomes rather than a product but more like a custom service to them did you come across situations where you had to say no push back to actually get a MVP defined, which could work across all these initial five customers? Again, a terrific question, uh, Sujay. So I think this was one thing that I learned very early on, and I had some great mentors. So we were working with a professor from Stanford University who's been teaching sales and business development. And despite of the fact that I have 15 years of experience, I didn't want to assume that I know everything. And we shouldn't. I don't assume that even today, you know, after being in this for five years. So we worked with him to kind of, you know, narrow down our first, you know, sweet spot customers. And we brought in the discipline of saying, if they don't fall into this sweet spot, mm. we're going to keep the relationship warm, but not accept them as customers. We're going to respectfully tell them we're not ready for you. Mm. Or let us build that. We don't think you have we have what you need but also tell them that we don't want to earn their business you know without actually providing them value which most companies we spoke to really appreciated right. they appreciated that we were not desperate we weren't you know just gunning behind some numbers in terms of revenue or growth metrics right. we were very disciplined in respecting them as another business and not kind of taking them for a ride you know yeah. That integrity and honesty, oh my gosh, paid off so well because all of those customers we said no to in the beginning came, you know, still became customers just a few weeks or months down the road. And they're still our customers even today after three or four years, you know. That's one thing that I learned through that process is it's okay to say no. It's okay to 
take a step back and qualify your deals very, very selectively, especially in the first two years mm. as a startup. And if you're honest and tell your prospect why you're saying no, they would actually appreciate and respect you as a founder for that. Yeah. And we saw all of them eventually become customers. So it was it was eventually a win win, you know, for everyone. True, true. And I must add, good that you brought up trust and honesty, but I must add, you had to show a lot of courage also to do that. It's like putting food on the table and saying no to it. Yes. So it's a fine line to me. And that's where, as you rightly said, I feel that differentiates many startup companies who are starting off who become successful and could scale their business versus some have a lot of hustle, as you use the word, in, in the initial years, but then they find challenging to actually define what their product is because they said yes to all their customers initial years very very valid point and like you said yes your your tummy really churns and uh, you know you feel like a kick or a punch you know in your stomach yeah. um where you're like oh my gosh somebody wants to you know give me their business and i'm going to respectfully decline yeah because it's not the right purchase for them right now, or it's not the right customer for me right now. Mm -hmm. And it's tough, very tough. But like I would say, uh, with experience um, and confidence, it worked out very, very well for us. And eventually we won those customers anyways. So just you just got to be patient. <laughs> yeah, patience is another word. Perseverance is another word with business, right? You have to persevere yeah. and continue that. So great learning shared, Resha. Thanks a lot. Now, if we can deal on the another aspect of business, team is another important part, right, of any business. So if you can share with us, how did you go about building that team to initially get started with links and take to the next level where you are right now? It's, it's one of the toughest things to do. Find people that share the same passion with you as founders. So again, we made a lot of mistakes in the beginning because we didn't know what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. But now I can tell you with more confidence than I could tell you three years ago that we've seen passion and attitude comes way before skills. Okay. Skills can be taught or learned if someone wants to learn them, right? So that attitude of I want to be here and I want to make a difference. And I understand my responsibility when you have like five people in a team to even 25 people in a team, mm. you're still very, very integral and you can't fall sick, you know? Yeah. So attitude goes far more than the aptitude or the skills. So we always hire for attitude and that has worked out really well for us. I would say we've got really lucky that we found those people along the way. There were times when we were interviewing 40 people, 80 people to find that right person. So again, that patience was key there. Mm. But whenever we've done that, we've had those people stay with us even today. They've moved from Chicago to you know, Sacramento as the company moved, we haven't lost them through that move. Mm -hmm. But whenever we took that shortcut of saying, oh my gosh, you know, if we hire five people right now, we know they would add X, Y, and Z in terms of numbers or we'll be able to get through that so much faster. Eventually it backfired because we spend more time training yeah. and bringing someone up to speed than getting something back, you know, from them. So... Again, patience is <laughs> has paid off everywhere. And that's, that's difficult to have patience because in a startup world, you're cramming up so much in your company, doing so many things, running so fast. And balancing that with patience, I think, brings in the character strength and the courage and everything, right? Showing patience is not easy at that point. It's, it's definitely not. And it uh, definitely, you know, it feels like a sinusoidal wave, Sujay, where mm -hmm. you're one day you're like, oh my gosh, I have to hire these five people. Speed is everything. We're a startup. Agility. Right. And then it backfires and you're like, this just took us way back in time. Because we not only lost that month, but we, you know, so it's it's hard lessons uh, learned. 
but um, it has helped me grow as an individual, like you said, um, immensely. Yeah, true. I think that these are the tribe and tribulations of a startup founder, if I can say right. And you are yourself growing as 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 you are taking the team and this journey through this part of the things here. Qualifying the deals is key to success in a business. This is one of the learnings I have taken from this episode. What learnings have you taken? Hope this episode helps you to draw your own learnings. Do give me a high five if you like this episode. I would also love to hear your feedback and suggestions for improvement. You have multiple channels to do so. LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram or email me directly. My contact information is provided in the episode notes. That's it for now. Watch out for the next episode of the Business Developer Podcast, wherein I shall continue my discussion with Reisha Shroff. Till then, stay happy, healthy, curious to learn. And remember, qualify your deals closely. Bye for now. <laughs>